Well, hello, and welcome to the very first video in a long series of videos called Economics with Tully. And this is, this is our effort to produce a series of videos that will translate economic concepts in a way that is understandable and accessible to the average American. And this is the very first video, which is going to cover basic economic principles, basic introductory economic principles. Um, and I chose this location for a reason. We are sitting on a barge in the middle of the Deerfield River in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful day. It's a peaceful day, surrounded by trees and open air and the water. And I did this because most people misunderstand what the topic of economics is actually all about. Whenever I tell people I teach economics, I, I will very often get a reaction such as, oh, I wish I understood economics, or, oh, you should help my son or daughter, they don't know how to handle their money, or, hey, what stock should I invest in? And with all of these comments, I, I get the impression that many people confuse the concept of economics with the concept of finance. Economics is not finance, although they can be closely related. Economics is a study of the choices that people make when presented with a variety of choices. That's all it is. In that respect, it's very much a um, kind of a, a sub-branch of psychology, if you will. When I decided today to make this video on the barge in the river instead of in my office, or on the front, uh, front steps of my house, I made an economic decision. It did not involve money. It did not involve uh, an actual cash cost to me in one way or another. When I chose to wear this shirt, um, as opposed to any of the other 20 shirts that are sitting in my, uh, sitting in my dresser, I made an economic decision. It had nothing to do with cash and nothing to do with money. Economics is simply the study of how people make choices. And if you can think of that, think of the, the subject of economics in terms of decision making and choosing between different alternatives and the ramifications on the person and on the society at large, then you've got an understanding of economics. And that's why it's not necessary to be teaching economics um, in front of a computer that can run all sorts of differential equations um, or to stand at a board and mumble all day because it's about the decisions that you and I make every single day on a daily basis. It's both a science and an art, an effort to understand how those decisions are made, why those decisions are made, and what the effects will be on ourselves and others and that has implications for policy makers and people in government when they're attempting to make regulations to uh, produce or to dissuade certain behaviors. So, as we enter this series of lectures on economics, first thing I should probably point out is that most of economics is divided into two different large categories. One is macroeconomics and one is microeconomics. Microeconomics is the study of those, those thousands, those millions of decisions that individual consumers are making or that consumers are making in individual stores and individual markets and the decision that individual producers or retailers or manufacturers are making in an effort to make a product that the public is in, interested in um, and that will garner them a profit. That's microeconomics. Macroeconomics is what happens when you take all of these thousands or millions of individual decisions and add them together and stand back and take a look at the effect on the entire economy. And so on the evening news when they report uh, statistics on unemployment or gross domestic product um, or inflation rates, they're looking at macroeconomic concepts. This series of lectures is going to cover both micro and macro topics, and we're going to try and touch on, uh, on uh, a little bit of, of all those different topics over the course of several dozen videos. So, for all economics, whether it's macro or micro-based, there generally is a three-step process that economists attempt to use in order to predict 
the outcomes of various policy actions. And the very first step is to gather data. Economists like to make decisions based not on how they feel about something, uh, not on um, uh, an overall goal of what they think is best, but we always try and start an inquiry by gathering data. This is often um, raised in textbooks as the difference between normative analysis and positive analysis. Let me give you a different, uh, an example of the differences. With normative analysis or a normative statement, someone might say uh, unemployment is too high or there's too much unemployment or the job situation is awful. Those are called normative statements because they are conclusions. They are opinions. They involve subjective information that you really can't test. What's too high? What's too tough? What's too much? What's too little? But positive analysis or positive statements involve using actual verifiable factual statements such as saying the unemployment rate is currently 8%. There are 250,000 people in this city looking for work who do not have jobs. The average wage in this city uh, for entry-level manufacturing is $15.20 an hour. Those are all positive statements. And don't think of positive as the opposite of negative. Positive simply means that we are looking at data-driven statements. They may be true or they may be false. If I said to you, I have three ears, that would be a positive statement. It would also be completely false. But it's data-driven and it can be verified. It doesn't suggest that my having a third ear is better then you're only having two ears. It doesn't suggest that I should have one ear removed. It's simply a positive statement. The same goes for the unemployment figures that I just suggested. If you say the unemployment rate is 8.3 percent, that doesn't suggest that it's good or bad or too high or too low or that you think something should be done or something should not be done. It's simply gathering facts. That is always the first step in an economist's approach to any problem, is not to decide, oh, the economy's awful, or unemployment is too high, and then run around trying to find the facts to bolster your argument. It's the opposite. The first step is to gather all the data you can about a particular issue. The second step in the economist's model is to take all that data and to organize it. In economics, we call this building models or model building. To take all of this information and to try and boil it down into ways that make sense. So, for an economist, the models we, we choose to use might be um, a, a mathematical formula. It might be a graph. In fact, we use graphs quite frequently um, in order to show the relationship between two different variables. It might just be putting our information in tabular form, into a table. And depending on how we're using that information, uh, we may call it a matrix. Those are the, the major models that we will use. And whenever a student is told, create a model to show what you're trying to, um, to, to illustrate here, we're, we're simply saying, make a graph. Make it visual. Give me a picture so I can see what all of this data looks like. Once we've gathered our positive data and we've put it into some sort of a model, we can then predict the outcomes of various public policy um, actions. So for instance, if we should, let's just take um, the example of a government official says, hey, I, I want to pass a law um, making it illegal to sell gasoline at more than one dollar a gallon because I think this will help people. Well, when we look at the current supplies of gasoline 
and the current demand that drivers have for gasoline. And we use our basic supply and demand model, which will be the subject of a future video. We can predict the outcome of such a proposed law. Now, personally, I would predict that the outcome of that law would that there would be increased purchases of gasoline because people would get excited. Hey, I can go on a long trip. I can, I can take extra trips in my car, and it's not going to cost me that much to fill up. But that supply is probably not going to be able to keep up with that kind of demand, and you're going to end up with a shortage of the product. So that's the way we would take positive data, looking at how people have acted in the past, looking at how they act now, not how we want them to act, not how we think they should act, not how we wish they would act, but how they actually do act. Taking that information, putting it into models, graphs, tables, charts, formula, and then predicting outcomes. And it's very important that we looked at how, look at how people really, truly do act not just what they say they're going to do. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago, I worked, um, worked in an area where they were considering increasing the amount of bus service between different places in the communities. And they decided to gauge interest in this by issuing surveys. And thousands of people were asked, if there was increased bus, would you be in favor of increased bus ridership? If there was increased, uh, if there was increased buses, increased runs, would you ride the bus instead of taking your car? Are you in favor of buses? Ninety-six percent of the respondents, over thousands of respondents, over several months, said yes. We want more buses. We'll ride the buses. Buses would be a wonderful thing to have. And yet, when more buses were actually placed on the routes between the points the people requested and at the times they requested it there was no increase in ridership why because that decision was not based on actual data on actual ridership but simply on what people said they were interested in there's always a disconnect between what people say they are in favor of or say they want to see and then what they actually do when presented with choices. And that's why, to the greatest extent possible, it is important to use actual data, positive data that can be tested, that can be relied on. Because when it comes to economists, while we may have some great ideas as to what we wish people would do and what we want them to do, it doesn't mean they're going to actually do it. So, there's our three-step process. Collect data, create models, predict outcomes. Now, in order to do this, we have to make some assumptions about people. And one of the most important assumptions we make about people in economics, and this is one that gets a lot of pushback from people in, in other disciplines, is that we assume that all people act in something we call their rational self-interest. I need to be very clear from the start. Rational self-interest, acting in your self-interest, does not mean the same thing as acting selfishly. They are not the same thing. Very often, I have a student right in the very beginning of economics have a really hard time with this concept of self-interest because they'll say something such as, well, I don't always act in my self-interest. I volunteer at a, a community soup kitchen, or I donate money to a favorite charity, or I have worked at a, at a walk-a-thon to raise funds for, um, for some particular cause. That's not selfish, and you're right. It's not selfish, but it is self-interest. To an economist, self-interest simply means that people act in such a way as to maximize their personal satisfaction at a point in time given the choices available to them. They maximize their personal satisfaction. You may have two people who each have a choice as to what to do today. 
They can watch a football game on TV, or they can go volunteer serving lunch at their local community soup kitchen. The one who chooses to stay home and watch the football game is acting in their self-interest because that brings them more satisfaction than working at the soup kitchen. The one who chooses to go work at the soup kitchen is also acting in their self-interest because given their ethos, given their value system, given what's important to them, it is more important to them to work in the soup kitchen than to sit home on the couch watching that football game. Both are acting in their rational self-interest. So when an economist says that all people act in their rational self-interest, we're not saying people are all a bunch uh, of you know selfish pigs. What we're saying is that they act in such a way as to maximize satisfaction in their personal lives, given their choices, given their value system. I chose to sit out here on a beautiful day because I love to do that. Um, I'm acting in my rational self-interest. I'm making a video in a place and in a setting that I absolutely love. If I didn't like being in the sun, if being in the sun uh, gave me a really bad sunburn or gave me heat stroke um, or I just didn't like the outdoors, I'd be sitting in my office doing this and I'd be acting in my rational self-interest that way. And it's because we assume that everyone acts in their rational self-interest that we also can assume that people will respond to incentives and disincentives. And we all do this. You're driving down the highway and you're going 20 or 25 miles over the speed limit. And I know no one watching this video has ever done that. And you come across a state trooper sitting on the side of the road with his radar gun pointed directly at you. There's a really good chance you're going to pull your foot off that gas pedal. Maybe even hit the brake pedal. Why? Because you respond to incentives and disincentives. And a $200 speeding ticket is a disincentive to driving 20 miles over the speed limit. If I say to my son, son, if you wash the car today, you can use it this weekend. If he wants to use the car this weekend, he now has an incentive to wash the car. It is more likely than not, there'll be a greater chance that he'll actually wash that car. Unless, of course, acting in his rational self-interest, deep down in his heart, he really doesn't want to be the one to drive this weekend. He wants his buddies to drive instead for one reason or another. In which case, he may just blow off washing that car. In either case, regardless of what he chooses to do, to wash the car or not, he's acting in his rational self-interest. He's weighing his choices, and he's doing that and taking that action, which maximizes his satisfaction in a given point in time. We have to assume that everyone does this, because if we don't, then we can never understand human action and never predict human action. And we believe, as economists, that people are somewhat predictable. We look at their actual habits and how they respond. Now, they'll respond differently. One person wants to wash that car and use it. One person does not. One person wants to watch the football game. One person wants to help out at the soup kitchen. And that's because as we weigh all of these choices that are available to us, we have subjective values. And for some people, recycling is a very, very important value. Others simply don't care about recycling. For some, following a sports team is a very important value. It gives them a lot of, of enjoyment. It gives them something to discuss with their friends, their, their relatives, their, their uh, classmates. To others, they don't understand all the excitement about sports. So, we all re react in our rational self-interest, but our value systems are all different. And because, going back to positive analysis, because we're economists, these differences in values are not right or wrong, moral or immoral, 
good or bad. They simply are what they are. And we take people um, at this very basic level and say, this is when we stand back and measure what people do, how they respond to a sale in the store, how they respond to a two-for-one deal, um, how they respond to um, free goods put outside uh, at, a, at a yard sale. When we look at what they actually do, we, can, we then have positive data to use to create our models. Now, as people are making these decisions as to what should I do, which choice should I take, we encounter the economic concept of opportunity cost. If you are enrolled in a college, there's a good chance that one of your friends may say to you, hey, I heard you're going to such and such uh, college, university. What does it cost you to go there? And in the course of a normal conversation, you might be tempted to answer, oh, tuition is 5000 a semester, 10000 a semester, 2000 a semester, or I have a grant, it uh, doesn't cost me a thing, which would be really nice. You're actually not answering the question. Because what you're giving them is the price to you of obtaining educational services. The cost to you, however, is everything you're giving up to take the choice that you have chosen. So for instance, if you choose to sit in a classroom and take a course, your cost, your opportunity cost, is not just the price you have paid in order to take that course. Your opportunity cost is everything else that you could be doing during that time or with that money. So for instance, your opportunity cost could be a day fishing. It could be working somewhere and making money. Sure, your tuition per semester may only be five or ten thousand dollars, but if you're giving up a full-time job that you could be working, you are foregoing maybe thirty thousand dollars in addition to spending ten thousand dollars. Your cost is much higher than the cash you pay out of pocket. That's opportunity cost. So, the opportunity cost for me of sitting out here making this video is anything else I could be doing. I could be working a part-time job. I could be cleaning my house. I uh, could be having a cup of coffee with my mom. I could be doing any number of things. And uh, in my personal economy, I'd rather be doing exactly this right now, right here. The opportunity cost for me is quite low. However, if someone called me up and said, uh, hey Tully, we have, a, uh, we have a private bartending job we'd like you to do, because I do professional private bartending as a side job, and uh, it's probably going to pay you about six or seven hundred and fifty dollars in tips. We only need you for two hours. Can you come in right now? there's a really good chance that I would not be making this video here and now but I would be making six or seven hundred dollars in tips doing something else that I love because the opportunity cost to me of making this video would be giving that up and that's simply too much so so far we've looked at an overview of what is economics and it's really simply the, the study the examination of the choices that people make when they have choices. We've looked very briefly at the difference between macro and microeconomics. We've looked at the three-step process that, um, uh, that economists will use when predicting the outcome to economic issues or problems. Gathering data, making sure it's normative, uh, making, excuse me, making sure it's positive and not normative that it's data-driven, that it's verifiable, and not simply the opinions that we, we or, or where we want to arrive at. We create models and we predict outcomes. We assume that um, that people are acting in their rational self-interest, they behave in patterns, 
they respond to incentives and disincentives, and we want to look at what they actually do when presented with those incentives and disincentives, not what they say they will do. We want real hard data. How do people, uh, how do consumers, how do businesses really act in given circumstances? And we know that when a business decides to uh, use its, its, uh, its limited resources to bring in one good, it can't use those resources to bring in some other good into the store. That's their opportunity cost. When you use the 20 bucks in your, in your pocket to buy one good at the supermarket, you have to give up buying anything else that that $20 could buy. And that's your opportunity cost. Two of us walking into the market with $20 bills are going to buy two different things. Our opportunity costs are different, are different because value is subjective. And there, it's different for each and every one of us. Lastly, since we're talking about the supermarket and how resources are allocated, a fundamental question in economics is how resources are actually allocated. In other words, who gets what? You don't have everything you want. I don't have everything I want. No one does. How do we decide what resources are allocated to who? How come I have a motorcycle and maybe you don't, or maybe you do. How come I have access to a barge in a river and maybe you don't? Maybe you own a house. I don't. How do these resources get allocated? Throughout history there have been many, many different ways that governments and societies have attempted to allocate resources. Um, one way to allocate resources is simply to have a dictator who says, I, I give these resources to you and not to you. That's one way to do it. Um, there are efforts, and there have been efforts around the world globally to have government attempt to make it equal and fair and to give everyone the same amount. And uh, this, is the, this has often been the case in um, societies that have embraced various forms of socialism or communism. That everyone should get what they need. There have been efforts in theocracies to say no one gets something. The destruction of the Buddhist statues by the Taliban in Afghanistan is a great example of that. No one has access to that historical, or those historical sites anymore because the theocracy in charge decided no one should have that good. That happened in this country, in the United States, when our government decided that no one should buy, sell, manufacture, uh, or, or drink alcoholic beverages during prohibition. Didn't work very well. In fact, of all the schemes you can think of to distribute goods and services, an egalitarian distribution, a prohibition, um, a uh, might makes right where people just fight over the goods like as they do in in certain parts of Somalia right now where there is no central government or where warlords rule the day it doesn't really matter what the official government structure is for allocating goods and services because I'm going to tell you something that every economist knows at all times in all places no matter what the society is, goods and services will always be distributed by price. Always, no matter what. Even in, the, in an egalitarian distribution where every single family is given a loaf of bread, let's just imagine this um, scenario where we have a, uh, a um, a government that makes bread and gives one loaf of bread to every individual. Will there be houses that don't want bread? Sure. Will there be houses that are uh, have a gluten allergies and can't use bread? Sure. Will there be families that have many children that love to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and need more bread than the one loaf they're given? Sure. What will happen? Those who have extra bread will end up selling their bread to those who want it. Or if not outright selling, they'll barter. But barter is the same thing as buying and selling. 
you're simply using goods to trade back and forth rather than currency. It's still a trading of goods back and forth. Goods and services will always find their way into the hands of those they want them based on price, regardless of what the government structure is. It happens in, uh, in prison camps or in prisons in general when um, the, uh, the inmates or those, the, those who are interned there will use cigarettes or weapons or protection or other means of, of buying and selling goods and services with each other. It happened during Prohibition. You know as well as I do, when our government instituted Prohibition, that did not stop alcohol from taking place. My own great-grandfather um, actually ran three different speakeasies in Long Beach, New York. Um, liquor was available, it was smuggled in, and it was sold. It never stopped. Government can attempt to prohibit, restrict, regulate, distribute goods and services as they think is best. But what it comes down to in the end is that all goods and services always, at all times and in all places, will be distributed by price. How do we know this? By looking at objective, fact-based, verifiable human behavior over the ages. Not how we want them to act, not how we wish we would act, not how we can design that we will act, but how human beings actually do respond. So, that concludes our first video on basic economic um, principles that underlie almost all of economics, regardless of what your particular political or economic philosophy is. Our second video is going to be a video based on the concept of demand where we take everything that you just heard and now apply it and look at how consumers objectively respond to changes in price in the marketplace. This is uh, Tom Simmons and this is video one of Economics with Tully and I hope you've enjoyed both the lecture and the scenery. Time for me to take a swim. So long.